And greetings there, microbiology friends. So we're going to do something that I kind of don't like to do, but since the test is take home, or it's all on take home, um, we're going to go ahead and do it. In that, I'm working on exam two, and I'll be posting that later today, and it'll be due at the end of the week. And we're going to get into um, some new material, like when both as an instructor and as a student, I always hated getting into new stuff that wasn't going to be on the exam. I'm like, dude, don't clutter my mind with this stuff. So what you can do is not watch this until after the exam, so you can stop now. No. Um, what we're going to start doing now is working our way through uh, different kinds of bacterial infections and really kind of looking at organ systems and uh, different sorts of categories of bacterial infections. Today, we're going to be looking at <coughs> respiratory infections. That's actually a joke. So before we get into that, there are some basic concepts of microbial bacterial disease that are important to think about. One thing is uh, it's important that we recognize a difference of bacterial-based diseases from viral diseases. And hopefully we all know that you don't use antibiotics for viruses as we are experiencing right now with the pandemic of the coronavirus. Uh, you can't treat it with um, antibiotics and antivirals are not all that well established. We don't really have great antivirals. Uh, there are a variety of antiviral uh, drugs that will uh, that are prescribed for the flu sometimes and normally what they're able to do is uh, shorten the disease uh, range that you may be sick rather than for seven days you'll feel terrible for five days my experience with the flu generally knock on wood is that I feel pretty lousy for two days and then after that I feel lousy for you know a week or so but not terrible and you know running a fever for a while but that's about it um, antivirals don't seem like they really do that much for you. They're not like antibiotics, which will absolutely stop a bacterial infection in its track, so they can. So viruses are a lot more difficult to treat. Consequently, the best sort of treatment for viruses would be uh, a good immune system, and that's things like uh, good nutrition, rest, less stress. Bacterial infections, though, uh, certainly good nutrition, rest, and less stress is helpful, but uh, bacterial infections can get started and we actually have antibiotics that can take care of them. So, we want to begin thinking about bacterial versus viral. We'll be talking about viruses and viral life cycles and things uh, a little bit later this semester. So, regardless, uh, one of the, a couple of points to keep in mind is that most bacteria are either good bacteria, good, that is they're providing uh, nutrients in that they break down material in our gut, they are uh, serving as a food source, i.e. yogurt, uh, they are good for defense in terms of um, knocking back other microorganisms. You know, I always think about ourselves as really being one gigantic bacteria parking lot and you want to have your body filled with these non-pathogenic bacteria. So consequently, you don't want to use excessive amounts of antibiotics. You don't want to use excessive amounts of um, harsh detergents and things. You want to keep your bacteria on you happy. So they're either good or they're harmless. They're just irrelevant. Uh, the human body is a rather hostile place for bacteria. Um, so the, the bacteria that are going to live on us or begin to carry out infections has to be able to survive some fairly serious uh, defense systems, um, either on the surface or inside. Additionally, uh, you can get bacteria in you that if they don't have specific virulence factors, these are um, either peptidoglycan or toxins, various things that are uh, responsible for them being able to maintain and uh, cause disease, the bacteria is not going to have that much of an effect on you. So we have these different kinds of things that have to happen in order to have bacteria actually getting a foothold, A, and B, uh, being able to cause significant harm. So. 
one of the ways we think about this uh, is that the bacterial disease evolution is kind of a symbiotic mechanism in that we're having a relationship between two organisms, the host and the bacteria. In this case, we might think of it as a parasite or at least some sort of um, hanger on. And there are a couple of really interesting ecological ways of thinking about these sorts of symbiotic relationships. There are three different types of symbiotic relationships. And I think we'll be able to figure out uh, where bacterial diseases can fit into this. But we actually have bacteria that are exhibiting these kinds of uh, relationships on us right now. So things like um, mutualism is one kind of symbiosis in which you've got um, these two parties and both members are um, generally getting benefit from the relationship. So just as an example, um, we've got, you know, honeybees and clover. The honeybees are getting nutrients, but they're also pollinating. It's all our pollinators and things. Um, humans and dogs are a nice sort of mutualistic symbiosis. Uh, the dogs are able to get a um, nice hug and cuddles and good food, and I have my blood pressure lowered and I get to have my face licked. Another kind of symbiotic relationship is one called commensalism. And this is a case of a symbiotic relationship in which one member is getting benefit and the other is really not being bothered at all. Um, humans and seagulls is lifted, listed, and I'm like, I don't know what the hell. Uh, humans aren't being bothered by seagulls at all. Seagulls are getting all kinds of food from us. Uh, the cattle egret and the buffalo, remora and the shark. The remora is swimming along with the shark and getting little bits of food scraps. It's not doing anything for the shark at all, really. Um, so it's, you know, somebody's along for the ride and somebody actually gets benefit from it. Parasitism is a bit more of what we're thinking about in terms of disease. One member of the symbiotic relationship is benefiting, the other member is actually being harmed. You're sucking stuff from them. So uh, parasitic wasps and tobacco hornworms is an example. Um, mosquitoes, these are generating benefit and then they are able to transmit uh, diseases and you know cause little itchy wells. Um, drive you inside from the uh, front porch of the beach house. Um, tapeworms, another kind of parasite. They're extracting energy from the host. Ugh, don't like tapeworms. All right, so now, when we begin thinking about disease, we've got a, another set of vocabulary terms that are part of the disease progression. And this is a general list of terms that we use. Not all diseases um, are operating in this exact way, but we have a, a similar kind of set of stages. It's a little bit like Koch's postulates in that these are a set of logical steps and progressions in a disease. So we, uh, you know, it changes depending on the disease type, but it is similar in its progression. So we start out with incubation. This is the pre-symptomatic period. The pathogen is in you. Uh, pathogen replication is required because it's just like as an example um, with the coronavirus, you've got to get a fairly large inoculum inhaled into you before you can actually start to get the virus. So probably having one virus attack you whoop, isn't going to do anything. You have to have several million um, viruses. You have to have a pretty significant viral load to get things started. Same with bacteria. A single bacterium probably isn't going to be all that significant. I mean, that's one little guy. And the time it would take for that one guy to divide sufficiently to actually generate enough bacteria that you can have some sort of disease pathology. Uh, in that time, the defense mechanisms are going to be able to take it out. So you have to have a enough of the material to start with. We had this incubation period. 
Uh, pathogen replication. The, the pathogen is replicating and getting enough uh, of the organisms around to do something. And um, you start to see you know, changes in physiology and damage and things. So the prodromal period is when we have the very first symptoms. Um, they're very often going to be vague symptoms. You go into the doctor and you're just feeling tired. Uh, sort of these are generic things like flu-like symptoms. You have uh, muscle aches, you start to run a fever, uh, you're just kind of feeling run out, run down. Uh, this is the body's first response to the disease. Then this progresses into what would be called the illness. Uh, symptoms are characteristic of the disease. If the immune system isn't going to be able to fight things off, it could be bad. It could lead to death. All right, so we start out with not knowing quite what you got. You just have vague symptoms of sort of feeling generically not very good. And then it progresses to where we actually have symptoms of the specific disease pathology. You know, yellow fever. You have a specific kind of fever um, and specific kinds of uh, infections and things. So then the decline. The symptoms lessen. The immune system is... Uh, starting to uh, gain the upper hand, win the battle. I mean, it is kind of a battle there. And your immune system is the primary system you've got to deal with these things. I mean, the, let's just remember that uh, antibiotics have only been around for a little over, you know, around 100 years or so, not even 100 years. And prior to that, if you had a bacterial infection, um, you had to tough it out. You, you know, one thing you could do was remove the affected limb, that was pretty much all you could do um, if you had a bacterial infection that was severe enough in a part of your uh, part of the body is you just remove it. Uh, now we have significantly better ways of doing this, but um, the main point, and you have experienced this with the cold and the flu, is that you get better, hopefully, and this is the results of the immune system starting to catch up with things. And then we have a period that we refer to as convalescence. The uh, specific symptoms are gone. Uh, you are tired. Uh, as this continues on, you start to feel a bit uh, better. One of the things that's interesting, I guess interesting is a relative term, uh, people can get secondary infections because the body is now been fighting and is not in great shape. So it is not uncommon that when people get the flu and you have a viral infection, that this can be followed by a bacterial infection. So people can get the flu and then from there, uh, pneumococcal bacteria that are always on in your lungs and things start to pick up. They are not being uh, kick back as hard as they normally are and they start to replicate and you end up with bacterial pneumonia on top of the flu. Oh, lucky you. All right. So another aspect of sort of generic disease um, contagiousness is that, or disease pathways, is you ha have to have the uh, disease causing organism get into your body. So uh, it enters our body, and we can talk about portals of entry. Uh, we have a variety of them. They're just standing around, and of course, you can generate portals of entry, like by stabbing yourself. Don't do that. Uh, then the system has to evade or some way uh, inactivate our defense systems, our immune system. The microorganism or the disease organism has to grow in us um, or interfere with our metabolic processes, and this is what's causing the symptoms. Um, in order for a disease to actually manifest itself in a significant way, it's going to now begin replicating, reproduce, and then actually uh, be able to perpetuate itself and be passed on. So it's going to then exit our bodies and make its way to the next host. Now just from a philosophical point, there are a number of things that don't fit into this. Um, things like cancer, um, things like Alzheimer's disease. They're not transmissible, but transmissible diseases have this kind of pathway. So, uh, as we talk about these portals of entry, 
this is an important thing to think about because they're going to define the specific types of diseases. Just as an example here, we got um, the nose and mouth. This is the portal, portal of entry for respiratory diseases. Things like um, pneumonia, things like uh, viruses, the cold virus, they're getting into your lungs. If you can block their entry into your lungs, you're good. So this is a point. You can have the virus that causes uh, COVID or a cold, the flu, or bacteria that cause pneumonia on your hands, but unless you get them uh, into your mouth, they ain't gonna do nothing. They're not gonna have the effects on your skin. So that's why it's important that we not touch our mouths and faces and wash our hands. So you can then touch your face, stick your finger up your nose, rub your eyes, uh, put your fingers in your mouth. No, don't do that. That's the way you can get stuff in to this re uh, respiratory tract. Uh, the mouth by itself is a place for digestive tract diseases. That is, you eat stuff, uh, you swallow it, it gets into your stomach, and then it gets into the GI. All right. Uh, skin is a, another portal primarily um, through injury, opening it up, um, or a bite, uh, mosquitoes piercing in. So the skin is a, uh, another portal. Of course, you can even have stuff on the surface, but not as common, not as severe. Uh, your genital tract, the urinary tract, the reproductive tract. Uh, a way of thinking about this is, any place you got holes, that's where stuff can get in. Not to be too graphic. All right, uh, we then have what are thought of as the minor entry points. And these are things like uh, the ear, the eye, hair follicles, yeah, your butthole, whatever. I don't want to think about that, thanks. All right, uh, so once a microorganism gets in, virus, bacteria, parasites, there are a variety of defenses that have to be overcome. I mean, first you gotta get in. The, we've talked about this a little bit, is the exterior environment is um, not all that conducive to bacterial growth. We have skin, um, there is movement, we have different behaviors. So <clears throat> you have to have um, things happen, like touching your face. So you gotta get the bacteria on your fingers, then you have to touch your face. So you, know, you can be exposed to stuff and it won't necessarily get in and you don't have a problem. Um, internally, we have a variety of uh, secretions Things like um, saliva have got enzymes that break apart lots of bacteria. Uh, tears also have a whole range of um, enzymes that can break apart bacteria. Lysozyme is an enzyme that actually degrades the cell wall of bacteria. Um, so we have, additionally, we've got movement. Things that are actually pushing things around, blowing stuff out, keeping it from going in. You have urine flow. Um, a nice pee is a good way to rinse stuff out. So you might have uh, a urinary tract that is open, I mean, it is, and bacteria can get in. Um, certainly when you're talking about the urethra, uh, but then you pee and stuff flows out. Now, if you have bacteria that can make their way up further into the urinary tract, that's when you start to have some more difficult uh, issues and you start generating um, infections and things. Um, so inside the body, we've got a whole range of antibacterial proteins. Um, there are very nonspecific, uh, what we think of as white blood cells, phagocytic cells that are able to engulf foreign materials. We've got um, the immune response, the adaptive immune response. Adaptive meaning that you get an infection, you can begin to develop an immune response to it. Or if you get a vaccine, you can begin to develop an immune response to it. Um, hopefully we'll talk actually a little bit more about the immune system um, as the semester continues. We will make time for that because it's a pretty cool topic. Okay, so now, as we said, uh, in addition to getting the, the, uh, the disease-causing agent, it also has to be virulent. It has to have the ability to cause disease. And these virulence factors 
are things that we can begin looking at that the microorganism has that are causing disease. And virulence factors are a really important thing to study because this is going to be one of the front spots in terms of treatment. So, um, we can think of virulence factors in a couple of different directions. We had the virulence factors that are doing things that are really nasty, the sort of offensive virulence factors. And then we have what we would think of actually as virulence factors that are making it so the organism is able to evade our host, our body's defenses. And so while these wouldn't be thought of typically as virulence factors because they're not going to be making you sick, what they're doing is allowing the bacteria to grow more effectively within the body. So they are in fact uh, really critical virulence factors. So we've got endotoxins, uh, lipopolysaccharide is a uh, real serious endotoxin, part of toxic shock syndrome. Uh, exotoxins, these are typically gram-positive bacteria, that is the candy coating cell wall. Um, it's usually uh, well, it's proteins and glycoproteins and things like this. Um, there can be a variety of enzymes that a bacteria can secrete, these so-called exoenzymes. Again, they're gram-positive usually. These are things like proteases that break down proteins, uh, nucleases that break down DNA and RNA, uh, lipases. These are things that break down uh, fats. And what this is going to do is begin to dissolve away the cell material. Uh, it can cause uh, various kinds of uh, defects in the tissue. You can have ne necrosis occurring because these guys are actually um, dissolving the cells and things. Cell lysis is generally the domain of viruses. As the viruses begin to replicate, they will eventually start to trigger a series of enzymatic reactions that will cause the cell to pop, to rupture, and to blow more virus back out into the system. Let's see, uh, in terms of uh, defensive virulence factors, these are things that are going to allow the bacteria, as we're talking about specifically, um, to either evade the immune system or maybe they can stick in places and uh, not be rinsed out or not be exhaled out very well. They can actually kind of hang in there better. So we have capsules, um, adhesins. These are these different uh, proteins and things that allow the bacteria to become sticky and they can stick to the, uh, say, the insides of the urinary tract. And so you can't actually wash them out. Um, other microorganisms exhibit something that's known as antigenic variation, where they're able to actually change the proteins on the cell surface. And these are the proteins that the immune system is initially recognizing. And they basically <coughs> <coughs> So I'm exhaling, blowing out massive amounts of material. Fine. The antigenic variation is something that you can do, where uh, it's like a, a stealth coat, where you've got a series of proteins on the surface that the immune system can respond to, and then over time, you knock those off and you change the kinds of cell surface proteins that you've got, and the immune system can never really get a solid bead on what it is that you're covered with. Um, this actually is a standard way that a variety of uh, blood parasites are able to evade the uh, immune system. Um, we got some guys that are secreting proteases that break down antibodies. That's a pretty nasty thing because the antibodies are the primary key for recognizing these foreign invaders. Um, there are a variety in viruses, different kinds of um, virokines. These are hormone type molecules that are triggering uh, inflammation and uh, then there are ways that viruses can hijack proteins on a cell surface to make them act as receptors for the virus. All right, uh, this is another example with COVID, uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme, which is found a lot in the lungs, is the binding site for the spike protein on the virus. That's why the virus tends to get into the lungs. So now, um, another aspect of the disease cycle is 
you know, you got to get in, but if you want to actually have the disease spread, and not want, but a really infectious disease is one that is going to spread, you have to have some kind of exit strategy, ways of getting the, uh, the uh, infectious agent back out. This is part of being a good parasite, is you want to um, accumulate inside your host and then go find another host. So the uh, offensive material can provoke symptoms like sneezing, coughing, blowing stuff out. Uh, you generate a lot of saliva, spitting, runny nose. You generate a lot of snot. That is carrying bacteria and, and viral particles. Diarrhea, a great way to uh, get your uh, infectious agent back out into the world. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to have a little bit more coffee just to get that out of my thoughts. Oh, God. Fine. Look, remember, I am a molecular cell biologist, and dealing with disease, uh-uh. I try not to. And so I'm thinking, saying to myself, I'm going to get this bad taste out of my mouth, and I see the word diarrhea right over my head. No, let's not do that. All right. Um, you can also have the microorganisms, they actually are um, situated in a space where materials are normally released. Things like uh, the intestines, uh, and so they, you're not necessarily having diarrhea, but just with a nice poop, uh, you have parasite eggs being shed. Uh, in the bladder, you're peeing out stuff. Uh, the gallbladder, you're secreting stuff into the uh, digestive system. The mouth, is a num number of places where stuff is being released, all these different kinds of microparticles being uh, blown out when you speak. Another strategy for um, exiting is just to wait. That is, you can uh, insist in a tissue, just sort of build a little ball and just wait there for a while. Uh, you can hang out in the GI tract, in the bloody fluids, and you're waiting for something to happen. Uh, you might be waiting on a vector of some kind, uh, like an insect that will bite you, pull blood out, and in that blood carry some kind of disease. So lots of viruses are being transmitted this way. Um, malaria parasites are being transmitted this way. So it's another standard way of moving things around is using some kind of um, secondary vector. I mean, the disease process can be really quite complicated and an area worthy of tremendous study. So, um, this is a good place to stop. We're going to get into bacterial diseases, specifically of the upper respiratory tract, the upper respiratory infections, things like um, strep and ugh, necrotizing fasciitis. I sure don't want that. Strep throat don't look all that nice either. Hey, um, thank you for your attention. Don't get any of these things. Wash your hands, but not too frequently. Although, no, wash your hands a lot. But um, wear your mask and don't touch your face. I will be talking with you uh, soon. So look for the exam here uh, this afternoon. That is assuming that you're watching this right now. Otherwise, I'll check in with you uh, later this week. I'm Dr. G, and I'm out. Peace.